Right, so we're going to be talking about light today, but light in a different uh, context than what we've been doing before. So let's talk about light. So for the foreseeable future, we're going to be talking about rays or light rays, as you guys are often familiar about. So often, we care about the direction that light travels. And there's a good reason for this. Um, but the, the basic reason is that the way we detect light is by light going from point A to point B. So we want to be able to say whether or not light gets to point B. So before we do that, I want to make a quick note. Uh, light propagates, just like all waves, propagates perpendicular to constant phase planes. So um, what I mean by that is, let's say you have a source, then uh, you could say that the wave every point on a circle around that or on a sphere around that source might have constant phase. And the reason for that is that every point on that sphere around the, the source has traveled the same distance, right? A sphere is the set of all points that have traveled the same distance from the center. Um, and so they would all be at the same phase. So when I say a, a constant phase plane, what I mean is just a surface over which the phase of the wave that's pa that passes through that surface is the same as the phase of the wave everywhere else on the surface. And this is not peculiar to light. In fact, all waves travel perpendicular to these. And that kind of makes sense. If they traveled not perpendicular to these, then that means that the phase would be changing along these planes. So they have to travel perpendicular to these planes. Um, and in general, light travels in all directions at once, given a point source, right? At least it travels in many directions, perhaps all. What I mean by that is given just say a light bulb, you're gonna have light going from the light bulb to a whole bunch of different places. But we wanna shift perspectives. So we want to, instead of viewing the source as our point of interest, we view the source and the observer as a combined reference frame. So by doing this, we narrow the direction of light, we narrow the direction of the direction which light travels. So basically, we're just kind of zooming in onto a very specific perspective. So we're still considering the source. But now, now instead of considering the source alone, which means we have to consider all of the directions that light travels in, we consider the source and, a, and an observer at a particular place. And then we only have to consider the direction that light travels in a straight line. This is a light ray. And I'll draw a picture. So we have our, we have our source. We have our constant phase planes. Trying to draw spheres is hard. And we have light traveling out in a whole bunch of different directions. It's always perpendicular to the uh, the wave always goes perpendicular to the these planes or these surfaces. But if we put a source here, sorry, an observer. By the way, this is how we draw eyeballs in physics. I don't know. I don't know why the eyelash is on top of the eyeball. But if we put an observer there, now all we care about is that single beam, the light that goes from our source to our observer. This thing we call a light ray. It is the part of the, of the wave of light that goes from a source to an observer at a particular location. That is what a light ray is.
So this is supposed to be an eyeball here. So by doing this, we basically will be able to answer questions like when will light or under what circumstances will the light get to our eye, i.e. will we see the light in various scenarios or what will the light look like to our eye and so on. So we can use this discussion of light rays to simplify greatly a lot of the phenomena that we would like to talk about like reflection and refraction and so on. So let's talk about reflection. Of rays. So we already know how waves reflect, right? When waves reflect off of a hard surface, they invert. When waves reflect off of a, sorry, a, a, when rave, waves reflect off of a slow surface, they invert. When waves reflect off of a fast, fast interface, they stay upright. But how do we talk about this when we're talking about rays? In particular, we can start asking things about angles. How do we relate angle of incoming ray to the angle of the outgoing ray? And we can apply Huygens' principle here. By the way, this lecture is going to be filled with a lot of bad drawings today, and for that, I apologize. It's, hard, it's very hard to draw well without rulers and so on. But the pictures that I'm trying to duplicate will also be in the lecture notes. So feel free to uh, take a look at those uh, after lecture. So Huygens' principle gives us the following picture. So let's say that we have um, a, uh, an interface. By the way, um, another way that you can model a light ray is with a plane wave. And that's just a wave that goes like this. And it propagates this way, where you have like peaks here. And so that's how we're going to model a lot of these light, uh, light waves, sorry, uh, light rays when we're talking about rays rather than just standard sources and things like that. We're, we're going to talk about a plane wave. <clears throat> so let me actually move this down so I can keep that up there. So the light ray travels perpendicular to the plane wave in this picture. Right, so let's, let's assume that we had a plane wave. Um, incident on a surface. I'm going to do my very, very best to draw this. So here's our perpendicular. We have a ray coming in in this direction, say. Let me actually put that like this. Oh, come on. So this angle we'll call theta sub i, the incoming. Now, what does that look like from the perspective of the uh, of the wave fronts. Well, we have one wave front, say, the wave front that is there, it would, it would have extended into here, but there's an interface in the way. There's a mirror in the way. And then we would have another wave front here. Right. So now I'm going to try to draw this in color. Draw it in green. So this is the incident waves. Now we know how those waves form the next wave front by Huygens' principle. You just would have drawn all of the little dots along one wave front, and that would create the next wave front. So let's look at this wave front here. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Um, so actually, we're going to need a few different colors. So let's use red first. So I'm going to draw. I'm going to use red for the uh, for the spherical outcroppings. So. Here's one wave front, and then maybe we have a different wave front here. But then the question is, is what happens to the wave front here? Well, this wave front, it, it emits as if it was a spherical emitter. So this wave front will emit um, this much. It'll move in that direction. What about this wave front? Well, this wave front comes afterwards because it hits afterwards because it was coming from a later wave. So that one I'll just leave as a dot. Actually, let me draw this in green. We'll just leave this as a dot. And now 
the wave front over here from that wave, that was even earlier. So that would be even bigger, right? So perhaps it's this big because it, that wave front would have traveled further. And so what you'll find actually is that the wave front found by what well, basically connecting all of these waves would look like this. Uh, if I could draw appropriately, it would look something like this, this line. And so what we find is we would find a series of waves that go off in this direction. And so if you wanted to figure out what uh, direction that is, that would be perpendicular to this green line. So we could draw a outgoing ray like this. And so that angle, theta uh, reflected. So what we see is Huygens principle, because the earlier waves reflect first when waves are coming in at an angle, we produce waves at a different angle once they're reflected. And we can directly apply Huygens principle to figure out what angle that is. Um, but it's a little bit easier to visualize once you just work with rays. Oop, that's too narrow. With just rays, the picture simplifies dramatically. We have our interface, we have our perpendicular line, we have our incoming ray. What does our outgoing ray do? Well, we'll figure that out, but this is theta i, this is theta reflected. This is a perpendicular, of course. Um, so one could, in principle, work out the geometry using Huygens principle. So the geometry implies that theta incoming is equal to the reflected angle. Just a fact about spheres prop or uh, circles propagating out of lines. And it's basically Huygens principle, but with a little bit of effort thrown in. So this is called the law of reflection. Um, basically, that if you shine an if you shine a uh, a light straight down, it'll come back straight up onto a mirror. If you shine it at a 45 degree angle, it'll come out at a 45 degree angle. If you shine it at a 30 degree angle, it'll come out at a 30 degree angle. Remember, these angles are relative to the perpendicular. Um, okay, well, that's easy enough, right? Rays make things easier to visualize, especially in this sort of context. How about refraction? By the way, that's, that's it when it comes to reflection. It gets a little bit more complicated when the interface is curved, and we'll talk about that, but for today, but we're not, we're not covering that today. So another question. So we, we, when we first started talking about waves and reflection, we initially just had a fixed barrier or a free barrier that the wave couldn't propagate through. However, we got a little bit more sophisticated afterwards. And we said, look, if the medium changes, i.e. you have an interface because the wave speed changes, then you'll get some reflection and some transmission. So we can ask the same question with regards to rays. What happens? when a ray changes medium. And that means that it changes its wave speed as well. Well, we know that when a wave changes its medium, that we get a speed change. That's just a consequence of material properties. And so what does that speed change imply? Well, it turns out that it implies a change in direction. And I will do my best to depict this well. Put a question mark there. But again, this is going to be a hard thing to draw. OK. You can do it, Sam. Uh, so let's draw an interface. Let's draw a wave. Let's, let's, call, let's call this a fast medium. say N1, and we have a slow medium here, N2. OK, so let's draw, um, how do I want to draw this? It's really hard to draw. OK, I'll, I'll just draw it dramatically. Um, let's draw two plane waves coming in. 
sorry, two wave fronts. So imagine that this wave is coming in and it's entering this medium. So we have a whole bunch of different point sources, Huygens like point sources. So uh, let's extend this one a little bit further. So here. So this one, say, has a large wavelength between the next. By the way, the, the, the radius of these circles that I'm drawing are effectively the wave the wavelength because they're the distance between wave fronts. Oh, so then I should have drawn this a little bit better. Let's draw this here. Right. But this one here, uh, if I had drawn this well, it would have worked out nicely, will produce effectively a wave. Uh, let me let me let me let me fix this drawing. because I need to get it to line up properly, otherwise it won't look right. All right, so I want a dot here and like a line here. And... Oh, terrible. There we go, that's good enough. All right, you guys get the picture, right? So here's our other wave front. Sorry, it's not great. So here we have an intersection with the interface. So that would produce a new source. Um, but now, because we're in a slower medium, the wavelength is smaller. So that means the radius is smaller. So perhaps, whereas the radius of one, so I'm just drawing that as, a, as if it were a point source, and here, we would have another point source, which has, again, a smaller radius. Uh, it's hard to draw. God, this is really hard to draw. You know what? I'm just going to show you a picture, because this is very challenging, <laughs> and I'm no artist. Um, pull something up. There is a picture in the lecture notes, but it's just very hard for me to reproduce it. Also, where'd everybody go? There's only 29 of you. Here's a picture. Right, so the idea here that I'm trying to convey is from one wave, from one wave, you have a whole bunch of different wave fronts hitting at different times, but those wavelengths are shorter in a slower medium. Notice how the gap between these circles is smaller than the gap between these lines. Those are both wavelengths. And because the wavelength is shorter, you get a bending effect. Basically, the earlier ones um, would have, uh, if, if it were to travel in the same direction without this bending effect, then that would mean that you'd have to ha have to cover the same amount of wavelengths in the same time because the wave is traveling at an angle through the, uh, through the top medium. And so in order to be a straight line, those waves that are traveling through the, the bottom medium would have to keep up with the waves traveling through the top medium. But because they're moving at a different speed, they can't keep up. And so what you're left with is you're left with a bending, a bending type phenomenon. Um, but it's more easily understood using simply um, rays. Or rather, it's, the picture can be simplified using rays. Let me uh, show you what I mean.
don't think people did that badly on the midterm, actually. I haven't seen all of the grades yet because it's not done being graded, but it seems like it's not going to be that bad. Um, right, so in terms of rays, we have our medium. We have n1 is fast. When I say fast, I mean it has a lower index of refraction, and n2 is slow. This is just for the purposes of illustration, but it works both ways. If, you have a, if we have our perpendicular, which we always need, if we have one, one ray coming in at, come on, at some angle theta 1, sorry, uh, yeah, theta 1, associated with index of refraction 1, then the ray will come out with angle theta 2. Maybe we have an eyeball here to indicate that it's a ray. Um, and so the relationship between theta 1 and theta 2, they're, they're definitely not the same, because we saw that the light was bending. By the way, this is why sp spoons look like they bend when you put them in a sink, a sink full of water. Um, this is called Snell's law. Snell's law relates, or also known as the law of refraction, law of refraction. is the statement that n1 times the sine of theta1 is equal to n2 times the sine of theta2. It's a relatively simple equation, but it basically tells us how the angles relate to each other based off of the index of indices of refraction, which is, in principle, hard to derive. Um, it, it explicitly depends on the uh, on Huygens principle. It depends on these wave fronts be having changes in wavelength, which means that they, that the places where all the wave fronts agree, where they all line up, is at a different angle because that wavelength changes and because the time in which the wave fronts reach the interface is different along the interface. Yeah, 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 you did. Um, so that's great. We have Snell's law. And with Snell's law, we can actually talk about total internal reflection which is a really neat phenomenon, and it's what allows us to transmit um, or to communicate via the internet across the Atlantic Ocean. So just as a reminder, the absolute value of sine of theta is less than or equal to 1, right? Like, it can never be more than 1. So does this lead us to a paradox, i.e., does Snell's law break down somewhere? Say n1 is equal to 2, and theta1 is equal to 45 degrees. So you have some material, n2, that has a index of refraction that's equal to 2. And maybe n1 is air or something, has an index of refraction of 1. And then you shine a light into it with um, oh, no, let's say n1 is 2. So it starts off in, say, something with some medium with index of refraction too, and then it goes out into air. And the angle it's coming in at is, say, 45 degrees. Snell's law would give us the following. It would say that 2 times sine of 45 degrees is equal to sine of theta 2. Let's say n1 is equal to 1, which would imply that the square root of 2, 2 times sine of 45 degrees is the square root of 2, is equal to sine of theta 2. But this cannot happen because 2, square root of 2, is greater than 1. So no angle theta 2 works. So what happens? Does Snell's law just say, nope, sorry, it doesn't work? What happens, in fact, is even more surprising. Uh, what we get is, well, first we should remember the following. Uh, in general, light reflects and transmits. at all interfaces. So if you have, a, if you have a, a change in medium, some percentage will reflect off of the medium, some percentage will transmit. And we saw that with waves on a string, remember? Some of the wave continued onto the thicker string, some of the wave reflected off. But in this case, none of the light 
transmits through because it would have to be at an angle that doesn't exist. In fact, all of it reflects. And so we get what is called, quote unquote, total internal reflection. Basically, by having a sufficiently large change in uh, wave speed bet between two um, media and having a sufficiently large angle of incidence, theta one, you get that light cannot just cannot get through that interface. So why does this happen? Well, the light, or so when the angle is, when the incident angle, theta one, is too large, the light can't bend away from the normal enough. So looking at this picture, um, sorry. Uh, let's look at the reverse of, the, of this picture. I guess I didn't draw it. So when light goes from fast to slow, what we see is that light bends towards the normal, right? It bends, it, it starts off at a wide angle and then it gets to a less steep, to a steeper angle. So in the reverse scenario, when you go from a slow medium, i.e. a high index of, of, uh, index of refraction uh, and, and one to a low index of refraction, a fast medium, you have that your light bends, goes the other way. Just imagine reversing this arrow. This arrow. Light comes in at some angle that's close to the normal and then it bends outwards away from it. Um, so when that happens, there is a, uh, it should be fairly clear that there's a maximum amount that the light can bend. It can't bend more than 90 degrees. If it were to try to bend more than, the, more than 90 degrees, it would not pass through the material, right? It would just reflect off. And so that's basically what's happening. Um, <clears throat> so there is a particular angle called the critical angle. We call it theta sub c. This is the required incoming angle. So that the outgoing angle is 90 degrees. So here's a picture. Um, so here's our interface. Here's our normal. Here is our fast medium, say air. N1, our slow medium, N2. So we have our incoming beam, say at some angle like this, this angle we're gonna call the critical angle. Then we get two things, <clears throat> two things happen. Um, so first, some of the light would transmit hence be refracted. So in that case, we have a green light beam that is refracted at a 90 degree angle. And then some of the light will reflect. From the law of reflection. And so what happens is that none of it actually makes it through. Right. If you are at the critical angle, none of it makes it through. You have one beam of light that just travels along the interface and another beam of light that's reflected. And if you go past this critical angle, none of it will be refracted. All of it will be reflected. And so that's, this, is the pro this is the phenomenon of total internal reflect reflection. You can have a, I need to go back to black ink. Um, you can have a medium or an inner, uh, a medium change or an interface that is such that if you shine light at an angle, at a sufficiently large angle, it'll just bounce back and forth. And this is the principle of fiber optics, actually. 
So I should probably write some words. When theta, uh, what, is I, what do I say? Theta incident, I use theta one. Now let's use theta incoming. Is greater than theta c, all the light is reflected. So we can solve for theta c, the critical angle, fairly easily, right? So let's say n1 of si times sine of 90 degrees. We're just assuming n1 is just the index of refraction of the outside stuff. And we want the critical, the critical angle is the angle where the refracted angle, the outgoing angle, is 90 degrees. This should be equal to n2. This is the angle that we, or this is the medium that we start in, times the sine of theta c. So we can solve directly. We get that theta c is equal to, not theta e, theta c is equal to the arc sine of n1 divided by n2. And by the way, you'll notice if n1 is larger than n2, then that you, there is no such theta c that gives you that because the arc sine is not defined for uh, arguments which are greater than 1, i.e. you can always bend inwards more. You can never, you cannot always bend outwards more. So that's what's happening here. So like I said, fiber optics use this principle. Uh, use this principle to send light down curving tubes. Now I'm going to ask you a question about this on the homework. But the gist is, if you have a tube that looks like this, and you send light, if the tube has a high enough index of refraction, and you send light, well, when it gets to that interface, it'll totally internally reflect. So it'll bounce off. When it gets to that interface, it totally internally reflects, and so on. And so it just bounces back and forth down the tube. And so you can send a light beam down a very, very long tube without actually losing any intensity. And that's what we do for, say, internet cable across, like, un like underneath the Atlantic. We, we laid down a really long fiber optic cable, which is just a long glass tube. Um, that, uh, and then we send light pulses down it. And the light travels remarkably fast, as, as we know it does. And so the light pulses um, are totally inter internally reflected. Then they're detected on the other end. And then they tra translate that into memes. Because that's all the internet's good for, right? <laughs> um, right. So OK. Great, we talked about refraction. What's next? Let's talk about dispersion. Dispersion is another interesting phenomenon that, that we can explain using rays. So a question that you might wonder, and you may have wondered this last week, is what determines the index of refraction for a medium? And unfortunately, I'm not going to give you an answer. This is just a very hard uh, e &M question, electricity and magnetism. In general, it's not something that we can derive mathematically. Um, it involves a lot of differential equations and very complicated calculations and so on. It's just not doable. It's, it involves quantum mechanics, electromagnetism, and so on. Sorry. Um, however, it is e easy to observe, right? It's easy to observe and measure. So in general, the index of refraction of a, of a material actually depends, depends on the frequency that the, of the light that you are sending through it. It depends on the, on the frequency of the measuring wavelength. What I mean by that is, look, how do we determine the index of refraction? Well, we know the index of refraction relates to the speed. So what we can do is we can take a light source, maybe a laser, shine it through a sample of this medium and time how long it takes to get through it, and then divide the, uh, the distance by the time. And there we go, index of refraction determined. But it turns out for most materials, in fact, all materials except the vacuum, the speed 
that you measure, and hence the index of refraction that you measure, depends on the wavelength or the frequency of the light that you send through that medium. In general, it turns out, higher frequencies gives us a larger value of n. And we know that that means that there's more bending that occurs. The reason we know that that means more bending is because the amount of bending that occurs is summarized by Snell's law, right? If n2 is very large compared to n1, say, let's say, let's say it goes from a vacuum to a medium, so n1 is just 1 and n2 is just whatever it is, then that means that you will have more bending towards the normal the larger n2 is. So you get more bending in, lar uh, in larger, uh, higher indices of refraction. Um, and there's a really neat way to demonstrate this, and that's with prisms. So I'm actually, because I, I had a prism at home that I could have used for this, but unfortunately I don't have a good white light source. All I have is a flashlight, which is too, too large of a source for the prisms I had. So I can't really demo this, but instead what we can do is we can watch a two minute video. So I'm going to share a, uh, I'm gonna, we can just watch a two minute video together. Um, yeah, go ahead while this is loading, that's fine. Oh, something's happening. The point is, is a small angle just gets, a, as long as the angle is sufficiently small, it'll just keep getting reflected. When a beam of light hits a piece of glass Sorry, straight on, I need to it passes right. pause that and share. All right, hopefully you guys will be able to see this. Um, so it's just a quick two minute video. It's actually a very good explanation for refraction and for dispersion. When a beam of light hits a piece of glass. Can you guys see this slash hear it? I'm actually gonna turn off my video for this so that um, it's a little bit probably better quality. So let's see if that works. Straight on, it passes right through it. But the waves that make up the light actually get slowed down by the glass and only go back to their normal speed when they come out the other side. That slowing down is what causes white light to split into a rainbow of colour whenever it hits glass on an angle. It happens because glass slows some colours of light more than others and because slowing down on an angle makes light bend. It's easy to understand the bending if you picture how the light waves would look from above, like how waves at the beach look if you see them from the air. And while white light's made up of all the different colours of light, it also helps to look at them one colour at a time. When a wave front of red light hits glass on an angle, the part of the wave that enters the glass first gets slowed down before the rest, and that changes the angle of the whole wave like how waves bend around a cliff. Violet light gets slowed down even more by glass, so its waves bend more. All the other colours get bent somewhere in between. So the colours get separated when they first enter the glass on an angle, and they spread out even more when they speed up on an angle as they leave. The reason that different colours slow down different amounts in glass is because they've got different wavelengths. Red light has the longest wavelength, followed by orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and finally violet with the shortest wavelength. And the shorter the wavelength, the longer it takes to travel through glass. That's because light interacts with electrons in the molecules that make up glass. Long wavelength light, like red, only interacts a bit with the electrons, so it doesn't get slowed much. But shorter wavelength violet light interacts more, so it gets slowed down more. So it's the combination of hitting glass on an angle and different wavelengths interacting with the electrons in the glass different amounts that makes light hitting a prism spread out into a beautiful spectrum of colour.
and some classic album cover art. So hopefully you guys were able to get the gist of it. I don't know how laggy it was on your end. Hopefully it was still understandable. Um, if you want to watch it again, uh, the link will be posted in the lecture notes. So check those out after lecture um, if you want to. But that, that, that's basically why we have uh, you know, the famous Pink, Pink Floyd Dark, Dark Side of the Moon album cover. That's why white light splits into different colors. And it's because the value of n, the index of refraction, that was how much the uh, that was this. That, that was what the presenter was talking about. The speed at which the waves travel through the medium changes for different wavelengths for different frequencies, and so, um, and so the, the end result is more bending for high frequency low wavelength light, less bending for low frequency high wavelength light, and hence we get a splitting of white light into its various components. Uh, there's another example that's actually also. Um, relatively easy to understand, and that's rainbows. Rainbows are a result of the same phenomenon. Uh, I will, again, do my best to draw. Oh, it actually looks like we might finish early today. I thought that today's lecture would take longer because it's like nine pages, but I forgot that most of it's drawings. Um, so I will do my best to draw this because this shouldn't be too hard. So let's say that we have two parallel beams of white light from the sun. And let's say we have two water droplets in the air um, that the white light hits. So we know white light uh, is composed of, um, let's move these down a little bit, a little bit further sound. We know white light is composed of all of the different wavelengths. So in particular, the light, as it goes, as it passes through the water, will bend different amounts depending on the wavelength, right? So um, let me draw, uh, let me get out color. So I'm going to use red and green. Green is a higher wavelength than red. So red light, we know, doesn't bend a whole lot. It's relatively low frequency. And so imagine that these water droplets are spherical. So we get a reflection, a reflection off the back. Some of it will transmit, but we don't care about that. Reflection off the back, and then a transmission, say this way. That would be red light. Uh, let's do the same for the red light uh, that uh, comes from the bottom. So again, we get a little bit of bending, a reflection, and then it comes out. Uh, and that should be bent a little bit. And I'm going to put the, uh, and I'm going to, this is going to be a, a congruence of confluences. I'm going to put the eyeball at the right place so that it looks good. I'm just going to assume that we're going to look, our eyeball, our eyeball should not be green. Our eyeball is, say, right here. So what we immediately see just from this, pic just from the depiction of the red light alone, is that at this angle, looking up at some particular angle, we would see it looks like that there's red coming from that place. So let me draw green first. So green light is also part of white light, but it bends more. And so it'll reflect off this part, and then it'll bend back. So we won't see the green light that comes from that light, light source, but we might see it that comes from this light source. And so what ends up happening is because we have a whole bunch of water droplets, it looks like we have green light that comes from here and red light that comes from here. So this is what we perceive. The red light isn't actually coming from this source. The green light isn't actually coming from this source. But the angle at which the light is coming from indicates to our eyes that the light is coming from that direction. And so what it, what it looks like is that red, we see red light as coming from higher in the sky.
Whereas green light, comes from lower in the sky. So you could follow this argument for all the different colors of the rainbow, Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And you'd find that red always comes from the highest part of the sky. And blue, or indigo, or violet, comes from the lowest part of the sky. And so what's the result? That if, if we are looking, if this is our, uh, Try to make this look good now. It's a highlighter. Where's my ink color? Draw. Uh, so we have red. So let me draw our eyeball again. So we have, it would look like that there's a red source here a green source here, and a blue source here, and maybe a yellow source here, and a indigo source here. That's black. Uh, well, you guys get the picture. And what it appears to look like then from the front, because of, this, because of the symmetry of the ways our eyes work, what it appears to look like if, uh, let me go back to black ink. If this is the back of me, um, it would appear as a ring, a rainbow. Now, question is, is why does this happen? Why does it appear as a rainbow? What needs to happen in order for this to work? Let's talk about the technical details of a rainbow. Just a few technical points to make. So in order for this to work, the sun always needs to be behind the observer, at least for the primary rainbow to occur, you, it needs to be behind the observer. Um, why is it shaped like a bow? It's shaped like a bow, not light a bow. because the sun is nearly a point source. Uh, the picture uh, drawn as a uh, very much not scale would look something like this. We have our sun as a five-year-old would draw it. We have our earth and then we have person, right? So there's water up here water molecules up here. And then there's, and so what happens is that we would get red from here, orange from here, yellow, and so on. And in fact, that traces out a circle. So that's why the end of a rainbow is not reachable, because the moment you move, it moves with you. Um, and it traces out a circle because the sun, if the sun is directly behind you, it's, it has that, that sort of cylindrical symmetry because the light is coming from the sun to all those points. And so it traces out a semicircle. And we just don't see the full circle because there's ground below us. However, if you've ever been lucky enough to see a rainbow from an airplane, um, then in fact, you might actually see the full circle. It's called a halo. Um, <clears throat> there's also this, uh, this bit about a double rainbow that you may have heard about. I don't know if that meme is too old for you guys, <laughs> but it was definitely a part of my, my, my childhood. Um, this double rainbow where it looks like that there's another rainbow elsewhere, um, like above or below the other rainbow, it comes from comes from light that has two internal reflections. So the angle at which the rainbow appears relative to your eye is a different angle. So, so this angle, this angle here, the angle of the red relative to the horizontal in your eye, 
this angle, it's just a fixed angle. It's like 30 something degrees. A, a rainbow will always appear like 30 something degrees ab um, above the line between the sun and your head, right? The sun back here. Um, the double rainbow will appear at a different angle because you have two internal reflections, so you get a larger angular deflection. Um, and hence you get, hence it looks like there's two angles. However, uh, because of the, uh, because every internal reflection for non-totally internally reflecting objects, some of the light transmits as well, the remaining light that is reflected back to your eyes is less. There's less of it because some of it's already been reflected away, some of it's been transmitted and so on. And so it's less intense. And that's why a double, a double rainbow is not usually seen because the, the, the primary rainbow um, scatters away most of the light and there's not just not a whole lot left for the double rainbow. Uh, on very, very clear days, you can, all, you can see a double rainbow because there's not a whole lot getting in your way. And hence why they seem to be less clear. Um, how many pages left do I have? I have well, I guess I'm making okay time. About halfway down with lecture, about halfway down with my notes. Right, so let's talk about polarizations. That's enough about rainbows and dispersion. Dispersion, by the way, I didn't actually define it, is the phenomenon of light splitting when it enters a medium of a different index. That's all. So polarization of light is a lot like polarization of other waves, but Light is something that's kind of hard to intuit what the polarization means, so it's useful to talk about it differently. Come on. So, in order to talk about how, in order to give details on polarization, I need to talk a little bit about how light interacts with matter. Like, for example, by the way, we know how a wave on a string interacts with the medium that it's traveling through, right? We actually did this derivation. We know why the wave propagates. It propagates because the, uh, if you have a wave, it yanks on the little bit of string behind it, and it tugs on the little bit of string in front of it. And so that, that uh, repeated tugging and yanking and so on on the string in front and behind it causes the wave to move down the string. The question is, is how does it interact? How do light waves interact with the medium that they're traveling through? Well, I've mentioned that light is an electromagnetic wave. It's a wave in the electromagnetic field. Um, and we know, well, hopefully you guys know this, but maybe you don't. Electrons are charged, right? Electrons are charged particles. Something about positively, or electrons are negatively charged, and the nucleus is positively charged. You guys learned this in high school science. Um, and so, Things that are electrically charged tend to interact with changes in the electric and magnetic fields. This is, and so in particular, we would expect light to interact with charged things. In particular, light in general causes electrons to vibrate. And it causes them to vibrate at the rate that, or at the frequency that the uh, light is oscillating at, right? Kind of makes sense. The electric, the electric field, when the electric field is large, it tugs the electrons in one direction. When the electric, electric field is large but negative, it tugs it in the other direction. It just goes back and forth. So the electron will vibrate back and forth. Now, that's how light propagates in a medium. And so the, rather than having the light wave just purely doing its own thing in space, what happens is you have the light wave traveling and then also you have the electrons traveling. And so they kind of couple together and they travel together through the medium. And it slows down because electrons have mass effectively. However, not all light waves can travel through all media. Some, and these are always solid, or actually no, I guess there's LCDs as well. Some solid media have special structure. And so you can imagine that the way that the light propagates through a medium depends on where the electrons are, right? If there's some electrons in one way, then the light might, might slow down when it encounters those electrons. But if there are no electrons in some other way, then the light won't slow down or something like that. In particular, 
in these very special structures, these, or these media with very special structures, the electrons can only vibrate. God, it looks like my handwriting's getting worse and worse. In one, in one direction, and not in the perpendicular direction. So imagine that you have a light wave, and then you have an electron that's only allowed to oscillate up and down, right? So when this light wave passes by, the electron will start wiggling, right? It will oscillate up and down. But say that electron is not allowed to oscillate back and forth. What if you have a light wave that's coming in horizontally, and the electron can only oscillate up and down? What happens then? Well, then the electron won't wiggle. And so the light wave won't be able to pass through it and propagate through. And so actually, this is a thing that happens um, in these very special structures. The only electric fields, it's usually the electric fields that cause this oscillation, not the magnetic field, only electric fields that cause vibrations in the allowed direction only those electric fields can pass through. And the reason that happens is because the, the way that a, a light wave propagates through a medium is, because, is by basically causing electrons to vibrate in sync with it as it passes through. If it can't make those electrons vibrate, it just can't propagate into the medium. And then the magnetic field plays along. Like the magnetic field doesn't really care. So, but we've talked about what the orientation of a wave means. There's the propagation direction, but then there's the orientation, which is the polarization, remember? A wave is, is transversely polarized if it, if, it, if it causes oscillations perpendicular to the direction of motion. And you can imagine in a three-dimensional wave, if it's traveling in one direction, it could be polarized up and down, or it could be polarized side to side, or at any angle, right? As long as it's perpendicular, it's still transversely polarized. And that that direction that I'm talking about here, that polarization, is the direction that the electric field oscillates in. So this implies that in these special materials, only some polarizations of light are allowed through. And what I mean is if you have light of one polarization, it might be able to make it through. If you have light of a different polarization, like maybe rotated 90 degrees, then it wouldn't make it through. So here's a, a simple picture. Um, let's say that we have uh, some sample of this material that has a horizontal polarizing axis. So this only lets in light only lets light pass through that is horizontally polarized, meaning that it has oscillations in the electric field that's horizontal. I'm drawing it just as horizontal lines. It's supposed to be three dimensions, by the way. And then we have a light wave that's polarized like this, that, uh, that propagates towards it. And this could be depicted as a whole bunch of different electric field arrows oscillating up and down, right? Well, that electric field cannot excite, cannot vibrate those electrons. So we get no light passes through. However, if we instead had a different screen, a different sample of this material, maybe we just rotated that one and oriented it vertically, now we can take this same picture, oh boy, We can take the same picture and now all of the light passes through because it was completely able to make it to uh, polarize or to excite the electrons. And so the electrons could travel along with the light and it would just make it through 100%. So this is what we mean when we say that 
um, when we, or this is what uh, polarized lenses do. They let some types of polarization through and other types of polarizations they block. And in fact, this is also, this is how modern 3D films work. Basically, in those glasses that you wear, one of the lenses only accepts polarized light in one direction. The other lens only accepts polarized light in the perpendicular direction. So on the screen, you have your two different projectors that project slightly different images, and both of those images are slightly differently polarized. And so what happens is that one of the images that is meant to get to your left eye is vertically polarized, the other image that's meant to get to your right eye is horizontally polarized. Now, it's actually more complicated than that. They use something called circular polarization because that's, that's uh, maintained even after a reflection off of the screen. But it's the same principle. You have, some, you have some, some light that can only get through one of the polarization filters on one eye and some light that can only get through the, the polarization filter on the other eye. And so your two eyes receive slightly different images and your brain puts that together as being three dimensions. That's actually, well, we're going to talk about that. It's basically how polarized sunglasses work, um, but it's not why polarized sunglasses work actually make the light less bright. And I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, unfortunately, um, the above description that I've given you is a little bit oversimplified. And I'll give you an example, or I'll, I'll give you a few points, a few points to make. So light can be polarized along an axis, can be polarized along any axis that's perpendicular to the propagation direction. Um, <clears throat> So what we can do is we can break up. So you guys know how, you guys know what vectors are, right? You guys are all taking 21C now. You can break up, or you have taken it, break up electric fields, the electric fields are vectors, into components <coughs> um, so that one component passes. and the other does not. So let's say that you have horizontally polarized, a horizontal, horizontal polarization filter. Let's say it's like this. So that only lets horizontally polarized light through. And let's say, um, let's say that we have a electric field that's polarized at an angle. Well, does that get through or does it not? And so it turns out that what, that what you do is you break up your electric field vector into two components, a component that's perpendicular, e perpendicular, and a component that's parallel. It's a vector, so you can always break up vectors into components. And so this one, this, this component does not pass through. And this component does. So what that implies is that if the magnitude of this vector represents the magnitude of the electric field, then this means that the amount that passes through always has a smaller magnitude, has a, has a magnitude less than or equal to the original magnitude. And when I say magnitude, I'm actually talking about the wave amplitude, really. Um, but they're vectors, so we can refer to them as magnitudes as well. So, and the reason for that is because if you, if you decompose any vector into two perpendicular parts, the legs of those, or the components in those perpendicular directions are always going to be smaller than the, um, than the, ve than the whole vector itself. That's just like uh, the triangle rule or the Pythagorean theorem, or however you want to describe it. So the point is, is if you take light that's not 
perfectly oriented with the polarization, mo some of the light will still get through. And the amount of light that gets through depends on the angle, right? If it's mostly in the perpendicular direction, the component that's in the parallel direction will be very small. So you'll have a very small amount of light that makes it through. If it's mostly in the correct direction, then the perpendicular component will be very, very small. So you only have a little bit of light that's blocked. Um, another, another point to make is not all light from the same source is polarized or it has the same polarization. Uh, and a good example are light bulbs. Uh, light bulbs emit unpolarized light. And what I mean when I say unpolarized light, I mean that it's this thing, unpolarized, means all combinations of polarizations. So it might emit some polarizations that are in the correct direction, it'll, but it might also emit some polarizations that are in the incorrect direction relative to your polarizing filter. And so what this implies is that in cases like these, half of unpolarized light, half of, half of the light coming from unpolarized sources, unpolarized light passes through a polarizer. So what that implies is that the intensity drops by two or 50%. And that, that should kind of make sense, right? If you're just as likely to be polarized in the correct direction as you are to be polarized in the opposite direction, you would expect that half of the polarizations would make it through. And that's exactly what happens. If you have a, if you have a vertical or a horizontal polar, polarizer and you put it in front of like the sun or a light bulb, it'll, the intensity will drop by a factor of two. In fact, so, so that's great. What we haven't told you is actually how the intensity changes for polarized light, right? Um, so let me, get, let me introduce you to Malice's law. So Malice's law is the statement, if the angle between the polarization axis, sorry, the polarization of a light source and the axis of polarization, of a polarizer is theta. So the picture that you want to be imagining here is this angle here. That is the angle between them. Then the intensity is given by the formula. The intensity that gets through, rather, that is that passes. It depends on theta, right? If theta is zero degrees, it's 100%. If theta is 90 degrees, it should be 0%. It turns out it's I naught times cosine squared of theta. And by the way, this ought to look awfully familiar. That intensity is rated, related to the square of some cosine. That, that's, that hopefully isn't surprising. Um, and by the way, this I naught is the intensity of incoming light. So this is a useful equation, Malice's law. Basically, it tells you how much light gets through a polarizer. Um, now, the, an important point is that when light, when light comes out of a polarizer, it is automatically the correct polarization. I'm going to put this in quotes. So the only light that makes it through 
is light that has the correct polarization. So the light that comes out of a polarizer is polarized. So let's say you take a light bulb, uh, light bulb is my pen, shine it through a, polar a polarizing filter, the light that comes out will be polarized in the same direction as the polarizing filter. So it will have filtered out everything that's not polarized in the correct direction. So um, now I want to show you something that's just very strange. And this is a phenomenon that can be explained using Malice's law and the fact that light coming out of a polarizer is uh, polarized. But it's still very strange. And I've done this demo in, in person before. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have polarizing filters at home, so I have to show you a video. So let's, let me show you a quick video again. Let me turn off my, turn off my video first. Can you guys see it? Okay, I'll play the video. Here I'm playing around polarized light. Let me start it over. Here I'm playing around polarized light. The sunlight is unpolarized, so it doesn't really matter what angle that uh, I, I, uh, if I use a polarizing filter. We have two filters, and they're polarized in the same direction. Then essentially nothing, uh, nothing too interesting happens. If the polarizers cross, then essentially. Oh. OK, it wants to buffer. But essentially, I, uh, light making through one filter is uh, horizontally polarized. Then the next filter only lets through the light that's vertically polarized. And so cumulatively, nothing makes it through. This is used to have adjustable uh, filters in uh, uh, photography fairly often. Now, something really interesting starts to happen. And in fact, a, a quantum effect uh, begins to kick in if I ask three questions. So surprisingly, the order, the answer I get depends on the order that I ask the questions. So if I uh, if I have a uh, horizontally, diagonally, and then vertically polarized, I get a different answer than if I ask horizontal, uh, horizontal, vertical, or horizontal, vertical, vertical. So in between, uh, I actually get a lot more uh, light transmission than you would expect. And this is a this is an angular dependent. Uh, uh, this sort of transmission. So it has to be between the asking the horizontal and asking the vertical question that I ask this diagonal question. And uh, this is really a quantum effect. So if I ask the photons the same questions in a different order, I actually get a different answer, which seems a little disturbing to me. Right, so this is so what you guys just saw is this whole three polarizers paradox. Um, it is technically a quantum effect, but if you understand it in terms of Malice's law and that the light coming out of a polarizer is automatically polarized in the same direction as, as that polarizer, it's not so surprising, right? The idea is you start off with unpolarized, and then that goes through, say, horizontal. So then you have uh, horizontally polarized light. Uh, it's hard to draw it in three dimensions. I'll I, I'll just draw. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'll draw it in three dimensions so you can you guys can get the picture, and I'll try to explain it as best as I can. Unpolarized goes in through. I will just draw it like this. Horizontal, and you're left with. So unpolarized light might look might look like this. Polarization in all the directions. Through that, you're just left with horizontally polarized light. Then if you put vertical polarizations there, well, Malice's law says the angle between these is 90 degrees. So you get nothing, right? But if we instead start with unpolarized light, so that's this, light in all the polarizations, put it through a horizontal polarization. Now you have light that's horizontally polarized. Now you put it through polarization at a 45 degree angle you're going to end up with polarization that's polarized at a 45 degree angle. And the amount of light that, may, that goes between these two steps, it's just I naught times the cosine squared of 45 degrees. So that's like a quarter. Uh, no, it's half. Half of the light will go, will, half of the light from this step will make it through. 
But now, if we put that through vertically polarized light, again, you get another 50%. So this is 25% of the light will make it through, which is surprisingly not zero. But it's because the direction of polarization changes between, uh, by, by putting another polarization in there. And it basically twists the light to let it go through again. This is technically a quantum effect. And it's beyond the realm of the scope of this class. But it's relatively easy to understand if you just think about the polariz polarizers just twisting the light. Um, hopefully you guys thought that was neat. I think it's kind of neat, but it is what it is. Um, so that's Malice's law, but there's another way that, or the, the, there are other ways that you can get polarization. And in fact, this is where polarized sunglasses come from. Um, and so I'm going to introduce this idea of polarization by reflection. So I'm about, I'm about to just tell you some things that are kind of strange. Um, and I just trust that you'll believe me. So imagine that um, the polarization is in the picture that I'm about to draw. So we have a plane. We have our perpendicular. And we have light coming in at a particular angle. I'm going to call that theta sub b. And let's say that the polarization is in this direction. It's, it's in the direction of the plane, meaning that it's not like into and out of the paper or into and out of the screen. It's, it's parallel to the, plane of, to the plane of reflection. Well, what does that tell us about? Well, we know that the reflection would be in this direction, right? And we know that there's that um, it would be transmitted, some of the light would be transmitted in this direction. And again, the polarization that's transmitted through would have to be in this direction. And the reason for that is transmission shouldn't rotate the polarization. So the trouble is, is light cannot be polarized. in the direction of motion. We know that that's true, right? Light is a transverse wave, so you cannot have polarization parallel to the propagation direction. And so if this is a right degree angle, these two polarizations would want to match, but that can't happen. That would mean that no light is reflected. If there is a if there is a ninety degree angle, so if you if the light is incident at a particular angle, this is called Brewster's angle, um, this angle theta sub b, such that the reflected light would want to be at a ninety degree angle relative to the polarized relative to the uh, relative to the transmitted light then none of that light can actually be reflected. In fact, this is one way that you can get 100% transmission through a medium. That's you take polarized light, you send it in at a particular angle, and because none of that light can be reflected, basically because it, it's polarized in a particular way, you get 100% transmission. So, but the, the, so, so this is a particular angle. It depends on the medium. But this phenomenon only occurs only occurs for light polarized in the plane of reflection. Right, if you had light polarized in the other direction, then there wouldn't be any issue because say it was polarized into and out of the page, this could still be into and out of the page and this could be into and out of the page. The, the polarizations could still match up. It's only because this reflection changes the direction of the light beam. <clears throat> um, so what that implies is that unpolarized light at the angle theta b will be reflected without polarization in the plane 
of reflection. What does that mean? It means that the light is polarized perpendicular to that. So the picture here is, uh, let's say that you have a light source that's unpolarized light, like the sun. Let's say you have your plane of reflection here. That light comes in, hits the water at, say, that special Brewster's angle, hits the source, whatever it is, the reflecting water is the usual example. And initially, this was polarized in all sorts of directions, right? Up, down, and left, right, and whatever combination. The stuff that comes out, it cannot be polarized in the plane of the, uh, sorry, I need to get this angle right. This has to just be polarized in the, um, in the in and out direction. I'm trying to draw this 3D, it's kind of hard to do. This, is, this light is polarized horizontally. because the vertical polarization, the polarization that's like this, all gets transmitted because it's at this very special angle. So the idea here is if you stick a person, not to scale, stick a person with sunglasses on their face, and these sunglasses are vertically polarized, then none of that horizontally polarized light that comes from the reflection will get through their sunglasses. So imagine that this is, say, a lake. Very poorly drawn lake, right? The idea here is that the unpolarized light that gets directly to your face, that's fine. That'll Half of it will make it through, and it'll just behave like normal sunglasses. But the light that reflects off of the, off of the surface, because of this Brewster's angle phenomenon, completely gets blocked or at least in principle, gets completely blocked. And so what polarized sunglasses effectively do then, they block reflections, block reflected light, i.e. glare. So by putting polarizers on your sunglasses, it both dims the normal light by 50%, which is a good goal for sunglasses, but it also just almost completely eliminates reflections off of like the ocean or reflections off of the tarmac or whatever, because those reflections have to have a particular polarization. And based off of the way that we usually orient our heads, you know, vertically, they can orient the polarizations in the glasses so that the incoming light that comes from the sun off of the ground to your face um, would be polarized in the wrong direction to make it through. That's why if you tilt your head while wearing um, polarized sunglasses, why well, you might see more glare. Um, so that just about takes us through to the end of today's lecture. Um, I will call it here, uh, and I'll open it to questions. What can, oh, by the way, this whole business of Brewster's angle, I'm not really going to touch on it a whole lot. Um, it's uh, honestly, it's, it's pretty esoteric stuff and I don't think it's necessary for the curriculum. So I'm not going to cover it more than what I've already talked about. Um, just the idea that it, that it, that it lets you have total transmission. By the way, this whole thing it doesn't have to happen at Brewster's angle, actually. It's just the all of the light, all of the reflected light is horizontally polarized when you're at precisely Brewster's angle. But at other angles close to Brewster's angle, it's just a, lar a large fraction of the light is eliminated of that polarization and so on. All right. OK, now let me ask questions. What questions do you guys got for me on this material? Yeah, so polarization light is really cool, uh, or polarized light is really neat, and it explains a lot of neat features. Um, we're going to get into optics, which can get really neat, and it'll explain uh, a lot of things. 
like why spoons bend when you put them into a sink. Um, maybe that's not particularly neat, but I'm glad you liked it. More questions. What can I do? What can I do for you guys? Uh, we will get to thermodynamics um, probably in a week. Sounds about right. We still have optics to cover. Oh. Yeah, check the online uh, course schedule. Let me see. Let me verify. So we will get to thermodynamics uh, starting on the 20th. So yeah, next week, we're going to start thermodynamics. We're going to finish optics this week. And then we will have two weeks of thermo. Or I guess a week and a half of thermo. More questions? Uh, by the way, I believe that today's discussion, and let me double check, I believe that today's discussion is going to be um, exam review. Uh, yeah, the next discussion is due on the 15th. No, no, it's available on st starting on the 15th. So yeah, this, this discussion, Mondays and Tuesdays, will be exam review. So if you'd like to show up and just ask questions about the exam, the instructor has, or you guys have seen solutions, but the instructor can answer questions to go over the uh, midterm. Uh, I believe that the exams will be done being graded by Friday. Um, and the uh, homework three should be graded. Homework three is due today. Homework two has been finished being graded. Uh, I'll post it today. It's not up yet because I haven't posted it yet. But, you know, expect it usually up before 5 p.m. today. It'll probably be up earlier, but it depends on what other stuff I have to do beforehand. Nobody has questions about the lecture material? I kind of covered a lot. Reflection, refraction, total internal reflection, dispersion, polarization, Brewster's phenomenon. How many questions for the quiz? Or for how many questions? I don't know, I haven't written it yet. <laughs> Well, you should be able to evaluate whether or not you can answer a question based off of what you've learned. All right, well, I'm going to end the lecture then. Um, 